When it comes to the history of the Disney parks, we've covered virtually every aspect imaginable. From defunct animatronics, abandoned attractions, unbuilt expansions, and even past restaurants. But one thing we haven't covered is the evolution of the Disney theme park ticket system, and over the years the drastic changes in pricing. So get ready for a different kind of episode, with a ton of numbers, inflation percentages, and the feeling of astonishment at the corporate greed and price gouging of Disney. But all in good fun, of course. The story begins, as you might expect, in July of 1955, with the grand opening of Disneyland. You see, when the happiest place on Earth first opened, entry into the park and experiencing its attractions required separate ticket purchases. First was the admission ticket, which cost a reasonable $1, or just over $10 today. Although an exception to this were the very first children to enter Disneyland, at least on opening day, Christine Vest and Michael Schwarter. These lucky rascals were given free lifetime passes to the brand new theme park, but their parents presumably were not. Another free lifetime pass was given to Dave McPherson, who had technically purchased the very first public admission ticket, although he received far less publicity. Anyway, once inside the park, visitors then had to purchase tickets for the individual attractions and rides, ranging from $0.25 cents to $0.75, cents, or just over 2 to $7 today. Now initially the only way to get these tickets were by way of ticket booths all throughout the park, the kind you'd see at a local carnival. In general, there was one central booth in each land, which sold tickets for all the attractions within said land, although some attractions like the Jungle Cruise had their own ticket booth, and others like it with higher capacity. Fantasyland was a bit of a hybrid, as its high number of attractions within such a small area meant traffic congestion was inevitable. This is why in addition to the multiple central booths, every single attraction no matter its popularity had its own ticket booth, which was done to disperse crowds a bit more evenly across the land. Walt, you've made a bum out of Barnum today, but we've got to go. <laughs> I know, but I just want to say a word of thanks to all the artists, the workers, and everybody that helped make this dream come true. Let's go into Fantasyland and have, have some, some fun. fun. Let's go. Goodbye, folks. Now it wasn't long after Disneyland made its grand debut that the initial ticket system was given a major overhaul. The person responsible for this was Public Relations Director Ed Inninger, as he came to the realization that the system in place was a bit of a hassle for visitors. For instance, let's say you wanted to ride Mr. Toad, the pack mules, and rocket to the moon. Well, have fun spending your precious time in three separate ticket booths across each of the three lands, and that's not even counting having to wait for the rides themselves. So three months after the park opened, ticket books were introduced, which were technically coupon books. With these, visitors gained admission into the park along with coupons for eight separate experiences, which were initially divided into A, B, and C ticket attractions, with D ticket attractions arriving the next year. And what was the price for this day at Disneyland package? $2.50 for adults, $2 for juniors ages 12 to 17, and $1.50 for children ages 3 to 11. Or with inflation, just over $25 for adults, $20 for juniors, and $15 for children. And just for the sake of transparency, my source for these inflation prices is the Consumer Price Index by way of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and chose the date September of 2021 just to keep it all consistent. So if you're watching this a month from now, six months from now, or even a year, just keep that in mind. Anyway, the next major evolution to the park's ticket system came in 1959, with the introduction of the e-ticket attraction. On the gala celebration of the completion of the project, the Richard Nixon family were on hand to snip the ribbon. Here we were with our monorail, the forerunner of rapid transit of the future, all checked out and ready to go, but somebody forgot to check out the scissors. You see, it's no secret that during its creation, Disneyland suffered from numerous budget constraints and forced Walt Disney to make quite a few compromises. So once the park turned out to be a massive success, he wasted no time in developing new and even better experiences, many of which became part of Disneyland's first major expansion in 1959. There was the Matterhorn, Submarine Voyage, and of course the Monorail. And with these more thrilling attractions, it seemed fitting to add a new category, or letter, to the ticket system. The E-Ticket. Although, to be fair, a few less than thrilling attractions were grandfathered into this category, such as the Pack Mules, Mark Twain Riverboat, and the Disneyland Railroad. However, despite the new attractions and expansion coming with the hefty price tag of $6 million, or just over $55 million today, ticket prices remained incredibly modest. 
Oh, and you want to guess how much parking cost? Just 25 cents, or a bank breaking $2.36 today. Now, by and large, the ticket system itself remained mostly unchanged throughout the 1960s. As far as the pricing, despite millions upon millions of dollars being invested into new attractions and ride updates, from 1960 to 1970, the price of a 10-ticket attraction book only rose by 32% although parking was raised from 25 cents to the outrageous price of 50 cents. But when the ticket system did finally have its first drastic change in almost a decade, it was actually for an entirely new theme park. You just ain't seen nothing yet. Wow, so as you wander through this wonderland, you'll find the wonders you never had planned. On October 1st, 1971, the Magic Kingdom opened for business, and with it came a rather convoluted alteration to the ticket system. You see, upon arriving to the Magic Kingdom's ticketing center, after having already paid 50 cents for parking, visitors then had to purchase a separate ticket to get to the Magic Kingdom. This was due to the separation between the ticketing center and the park itself, so transportation was offered, and required via ferryboat or monorail. Once across Bay Lake and at the park's entrance, you then had to make another purchase to get into the Magic Kingdom. But Disney counted on this being a major hassle, and conveniently offered the Adventure Ticket Book, which included transportation, park admission, as well as coupons for attractions and rides. That said, the prices for these Adventure Books were still incredibly reasonable, with a day at the Magic Kingdom costing around $4 to $6, or $30 to $40 today. Now before going forward, I need to briefly mention what at first might seem unrelated to all this, and that was the Magic Kingdom Club. Oddly enough, the Magic Kingdom Club did not begin with the Magic Kingdom, but with Disneyland in 1957, and was essentially a discount program. You see, major businesses and companies would give Disney free publicity, and in exchange they were able to offer their employees free membership into the program, which served as an incentive to join said company. Members would then receive discounts on transportation to both the California Disney Park and Florida Park, and eventually parks, as well as most of Disney's hotels and resorts. It also offered free park admission, but members still had to pay for ticket books in the form of specially discounted Magic Key books. However, there's a more specific reason I bring up the Magic Kingdom Club, as in 1977 they were a test group of sorts for an experimental brand new ticket system. You're a very special part of our family. We don't want you to miss out on any of the special activities and events planned for the family reunion year. Presentation of your membership card at Disneyland's main entrance by any member of your family will enable you to purchase special value Magic Kingdom Club tickets during the summertime and fall, winter, and spring as well. You see, the idea was to scrap separate admission tickets and attraction coupons altogether, and instead provide all-inclusive passports. Of course, this also meant getting rid of the A through E attraction classes, so going forward, each experience would be seen as equal in the eyes of the mouse. But while these particular passports were initially exclusive to the Magic Kingdom Club, beginning in 1981, they were offered year-round to the public as well. Beginning with Disneyland, for a single day it was $10.25 for adults, $9 for juniors, and $8.50 for children. Even adjusting for inflation, these prices are still shockingly affordable. Oh yeah, and parking was now a staggering $1 to $2 depending on the season, or $3 to $5 today. When it came to Disney World's implementation of the all-inclusive passport, it wasn't until the opening of Epcot that it was fully embraced. I say that because they also began offering new attraction books alongside the passports, but these contained coupons that worked for any ride or show, regardless of the A through E designation. However, within a year or so, these coupon books were abandoned, and passports became the primary ticket system across all parks. That said, a single-day passport for Epcot or the Magic Kingdom was $13 for adults, $12 for juniors, and $11 for children. Today, that'd be just under $40 for adults, $36 for juniors, and $33 for children. As far as the multi-day passport, well, this is when things start to get incredibly tedious, as Disney also introduced two, three, four, and six-day options as well as world passports, aka park hoppers. So to keep things simple-ish, we'll be focusing on adult single-day ticket pricing from here on out. But as you can see, even a top-tier six-day world passport cost a reasonable $60, or $167 today. Although keep in mind, Disney World only had two parks at this point, but still, that's pretty insane. Whenever there's a fast-breaking news story in the Magic Kingdom, you'll find journalists of real character drop everything to get the news out. Especially when it's good news. Today's good news. The unlimited-use passport is here year-round. 
With the implementation of the Disney Passport came a new sense of freedom for visitors, and also alleviated families of the often confusing and convoluted A through E attraction system. Another bonus was the newfound ability for park goers to experience an attraction as many times as they wanted, as without having to worry about individual tickets, their ride choices were allowed to be far more spontaneous. Because, let's face it, having to pay to ride your favorite attractions is a bit ridiculous. But hey, at least it's all in the past, as Disney would have to be crazy to revive such an incredibly outdated business model. I mean, can you imagine the outrage it would cause? Oh. Now in a way, this is really when the, for lack of a better word, corporate greed and money grubbing of the Disney parks became far more aggressive. A specific and rather blatant example was in 1984, as they essentially threw the median price junior ticket category out the window, and then adjusted the age range for the child ticket from 3 to 11 to 3 to 12. This meant that if a child was 13 years or older, congratulations, your kid was now seen as a full-priced adult in the eyes of Disney, and a way to get a little more money from your wallets. But not all these ticketing changes are bad, such as the official debut of the annual passport for Walt Disney World in 1983. These year-long passports without any blockout dates could be purchased for $100, or $269 today. Disneyland's annual passports came out the next year, at the cost of a very reasonable $85 for adults, or about $228 today. But the real price gouging of the Disney parks began with a certain someone circa 1984, and I'll give you one guess as to who. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, and welcome to the Disney Sunday Movie. Now, much like the upcoming two-part series, How Michael Eisner Saved and Then Almost Completely Destroyed the Disney Parks, his presence was bittersweet when it came to theme park tickets. You see, alongside Frank Wells, he was the primary driving force behind a slew of innovative experiences, such as Star Tours, Captain EO, and eventually the Indiana Jones Adventure. This increased park attendance tremendously, and at a time when Disneyland was seen as only for kids and families, gave it the edge and cool factor it desperately needed. But with this revitalization came a pretty staggering jump in ticket pricing. You see, from the implementation of the passport system to 1985, there was a modest 46% increase in pricing. However, from 1985 to 1990, there was a whopping 83% increase, with a day at Disneyland going from an even $15 to costing $27.50, or $56 today. Heck, parking alone jumped the same amount in five years as it did in the almost 30 years prior. Walt Disney World saw a similar spike in pricing, with a hefty increase of 72%, or 134% from the debut of the day passports in 1982. As far as the year-long annual passports, from 1985 to 1990, Disney World's increased by 33%, which obviously wasn't all that drastic. Disneyland's, on the other hand, rose by a staggering 112%, from $85 in 1985 to nearly $180 by 1990, or $221 to almost $400 today. To add insult to injury, Disney also adjusted the cutoff range for the child ticket, as it went from 3 to 12 to 3 to 10. Which, I'm sorry, but categorizing an 11-year-old as an adult simply to charge more for their entry is pretty absurd. We can charge anything we want, 2,000 a day, 10,000 a day, and people will pay it. <laughs> now, just to play devil's advocate before I come across as too cynical, the price increases weren't without justification. After all, Disney was creating experiences far more advanced and expensive to produce than anything they'd ever done in the past. 1989 also saw the addition of Disney MGM Studios, so the major hikes in prices were, for the most part, understandable. Anyway, when it came to non-pricing changes to the Disney theme park ticket system, the 90s saw quite a few. One of them was in 1992, in which ticket stamping and processing was done by turnstiles instead of cast members. Which granted, isn't the most exciting, but I'm trying to be thorough here. The next major change was the result of a problem Disney had been trying to solve for literal decades at all their parks. Ticket scalpers. Hey, hey, are you selling? Oh, yeah, I'm selling. You see, the resale market for tickets was growing into quite the source of frustration for the company. It screwed up maintaining a proper maximum capacity, getting accurate guest attendance numbers, keeping track of who was using the tickets or even in the Disney parks, etc. So in 1994, they began requiring photographs to be taken of each and every visitor, which was then assigned and printed on each ticket. Also, notice the not-so-subtle resale this ticket is a crime warning. This was actually met with a bit of resistance, as some people weren't all too happy with Disney keeping a visual record of each and every guest. But let's be honest, they were already doing that with on-ride photos and attractions like Splash Mountain. However, two years later, this identification system was abandoned in favor of an automated ticketing system. By way of a magnetic strip, Disney was able to store and track guest information and the number of days used on a ticket via computer. 
To the company's relief, this once and for all put an end to the troublesome Disney ticket sale black market. We bought the five day super duper pass ticket because we could use this anytime in our lifetime. Now to be honest, that pretty much does it for the evolution of the ticket system itself. But we still have quite a bit more to cover when it comes to the insane price changes. So get ready for a lot of numbers and bar graphs. As far as Disneyland, compared to the massive price increase of the mid-80s, 1990 to the year 2000 was surprisingly modest, at just 22% with each five-year period. As far as Walt Disney World, despite the opening of Disney's fourth Florida theme park with Animal Kingdom, the price increases were also pretty minimal. When it came to the annual passports, aside from giving the designs of the cards a bit more personality, Disneyland's premium annual pass rose by just 11%. And after raising the price to $1.99, that's where it stayed for nearly a decade. But, and this is a big but, that's due to the implementation of tiered passes, which introduced, among other things, the oh-so-lovely blackout dates. Now, as far as Walt Disney World's annual passports, they also began offering tiered pricing. However, their premium passes also included Pleasure Island, River Country, and the water parks. Oh, and oddly specific annual passes like the Epcot after 4pm option. So we'll just focus on Disney World's standard no blockout dates annual pass to the main parks, which had a pretty hefty increase from 1990 to the year 2000. But think about that. In the year 2000, you could still get a premium Disneyland annual passport for $1.99, or just over $300 today, and access to the four Florida Disney theme parks all year round for $2.69, or just over $400 today. But now we get to the true corporate greed and soul-crushing price increases, which really began with Disney's California Adventure. Welcome to the Disneyland Resort, Southern California's newest and biggest vacation destination. In this Disneyland Resort video guide, we'll take you through all the magic and excitement the resort has to offer. You see, the opening of Disney's California Adventure, along with Downtown Disney and the nearby hotels, solidified Disneyland as a true resort destination. But as most of you already know, the new theme park really struggled in the beginning, and at its worst was only able to maintain 30-45% to of its maximum visitor capacity. There were also the ramifications of 9-11 on tourism in general, the cost-cutting practices of Disneyland president Paul Pressler, the downfall of Michael Eisner, so yeah, the early 2000s was quite the dark spot in the Disney timeline. But then you have the, let's call it early Bob Iger era, who after becoming Disney CEO in 2005, made getting the parks back on the right track a top priority. Part of this, of course, was the $1.1 billion expansion and transformation of the floundering California adventure. He also repaired the infamously troubled Disney-Pixar relationship, and played a part of the reimagining and reopening of Submarine Voyage, as well as the development of Cars Land just to name a few examples. So with all that being said, and beginning with Disneyland single day tickets, it's interesting to see how the two halves of the decade stack up, as the early Iger era saw price jumps that harken back to the early Michael Eisner era. Walt Disney World saw a similar pattern, and within the 10 years between 2000 and 2010, ticket prices rose by a tad less than Disneyland's. When it came to the annual passes, Walt Disney World had a minor difference in pricing between the two halves of the decade, with the higher increase of course being in the latter Iger era. Disneyland, on the other hand, rose by a massive 75%, then a substantial 32%, or 440% total from its initial debut. So to put that all into perspective, in 2010, Disneyland's premium annual passes were still just $4.59, or $574 today, and Disney World's annual passes were just $4.99, or $624 today. As far as single-day tickets, Disneyland's was $76, or $95 today, and Disney World's was $82, or $102 today. Okay, I would imagine you were just as mentally exhausted as I am, so instead of recapping the years 2010 to the present, let's just cut to the chase of the final decade of price increases. But just keep in mind that beginning in 2017, for single-day tickets, Disney also began using a tiered system, so we'll be basing this off the highest price. Due to this new price structure, in just a decade, Disneyland ticket sales increased by 30%, and then a staggering 56%, or 1,402% from the introduction of the day passports, and was also the highest 10-year price increase within the original park's entire history. But the California park wasn't alone, as the Florida park's price increases were also quite shocking, and unsurprisingly, the largest jump in ticket pricing in Walt Disney World's entire history, at 1,101% 1 total. 
Last but not least, we have the annual passes, in which Disneyland's premium annual passports increased by a mind-melting 129%, and then another hefty price jump of 43%, with an increase of 1,664% total since 1984. Disney World's annual passports saw a pretty modest increase of 31%, but then a whopping 83% increase, or 1,095% total since their original debut. Now, as tempting as it is to dive into the upcoming Disney ticket price changes, with my luck, they'll change by the time I finally get this video out. So I think that just about does it for now. And for those that have stuck around this long, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and that your brain doesn't hurt too much.